Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm gonna tell you about the Neverglades Mysteries. I mean, you probably know about the Neverglades Mysteries, and if you don't, then you should click the little eye up in the top right corner of the screen right now, because that'll link you to the full playlist of all the Neverglades Mysteries. It's a fantastic series that's being made by David Farrows. Currently, there's three books available right now on Amazon, but that's really not what I'm here to tell you about. If you guys have been a fan of the Neverglades Mysteries, or if you're just finding out about it right now, I also want to direct you to the link in the description down below that leads you to the Kickstarter. Right now, there's a Kickstarter for the Neverglades Mysteries video game. You absolutely heard me right. <laughs> the Neverglades Mysteries video game is currently being produced and currently has a campaign live on Kickstarter. You can check out the campaign link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. For such a small town, Pacific Glade has a surprising amount of commodities. We somehow managed to cram all the stuff that you need into a little corner of Washington. A police station, a high school, a strip mall, a whole slew of gas stations and convenience stores, and plenty of family-run businesses for all the services you could possibly require. There's a reason most people never leave. You've got all the necessities in one cozy little place. Well, almost all of them. The only thing that we're really missing is a hospital, and given the tendency for weird crimes in our area, we notice its absence, believe me. The closest one is about 20 miles down the road, in Lyonsville, right where the town meets the border of the forest. It's also where my wife happens to work as a nursing assistant. Janine loves her job, but the hours are shitty, and sometimes she has to work into the wee hours of the morning. Luckily, I'm used to overnight shifts as a cop. On those nights when she has to miss dinner, I'll stick her plate in the fridge and put on some garbage television until she gets home again. I always like to kiss her goodnight, even if that night starts at 4am. What can I say? I put on a gruff face for the boys and girls at the station, but deep down, I'm a hopeless romantic. Lately, I've had to drive Janine to and from work since our crappy old sedan had finally wheezed its last breath. The repair shop downtown has their hands full with that rust bucket, so I've been using my police cruiser as a makeshift carpool. It's technically fine as long as I'm on the clock and my patrol duties take priority. Early morning tends to be a quiet stretch for criminal activity, so most of the time these pickups go off without a hitch. There are exceptions, though. Crimes committed in the dead of night. Animal attacks. Minor crises on the occasional graveyard shift. There's a lot of monsters out there, human or otherwise, and sleep rarely slows them down. You gotta be ready for anything at any time. I was driving Janine home from a particularly late shift the other day when my comm radio crackled. Sheriff, you copy? It's Officer Velasquez. We got a complaint call from our near catamount. Sounds like Larry the Drunk Wonder is at it again. Janine chuckled in the passenger seat. But I just rolled my eyes. What else is new? I said. I'm on my way. Just tell me where to go. Velasquez recites the address, and my radio went quiet. I took the first left off the highway and went rumbling down the dirt road towards Catamount Forest. It sounded like the scene of the commotion was one of the cottages at the edge of the woods, out where the glade gave way to acres of trees and foliage. God only knows what Larry was doing in the middle of nowhere. Guy was a real thorn in our side, a perpetual drunk who spent most of his weekend snoozing in a cell down at the station, and his outbursts were so common that taking him in had become a kind of routine. I didn't envy the poor soul he was bothering at three in the morning. The road climbed higher and higher, running along a precarious cliffside that overlooked shadowy stretches of forest. We passed a few of those little woodsy cottages before the road curved and dumped us at our destination. Unlike the ones we'd passed, there was nothing quaint about this cottage. The paint was chipped on all the shutters. Chunks of brick were missing from the walls. And the rose bushes wrapped around the house were barely more than thorns and drooping petals. The two men were waiting for us in the driveway. The first was Larry Hogan, also known as Larry the Drunk Wonder. His whole body was slumped like he had forgotten how to stand. His thinning hair fluttered in the breeze like a dandelion clump. The second man was shorter and broad-shouldered, like a football player. He stood next to Larry, with his arms crossed and an irritable scowl on his face. Both men squinted and shielded their eyes in the glare of the headlights. I killed the engine and stepped out of the cruiser. Morning, boys, I called. Something the problem here? About damn time you cops got here, shorter man grumbled. This motherfucker knocked on my door about an hour ago, shouted to let him in, rolled out of bed, told him to fuck off. 
got pretty obvious that he wasn't leaving, so I tried to talk to him. Took him inside, sat him down, got him a cup of coffee and everything. Guy took one sip, chucked the mug at my fridge, started screaming and hollering and making a fucking scene. So I called you guys. And coffee tastes like shit, Larry slurred. And you owe me money, you piece of shit. I don't owe him nothing, the other man said. Guy's so fucked up, he's talking out of his asshole. Be really great if you got him off my property, officer. I was no fan of Larry Hogan, but this guy's tone made me bristle. Now, it'd be really great if you didn't tell me how to do my job, Mr. Wheaton, he said. John Wheaton. The name tickled at my brain, but I couldn't quite place it. It was gone before I could pin it down. I cast a look at Larry. The man was barely staying on his feet. His body swayed like a blade of grass in the wind. I had no reason to doubt Wheaton's story. It was hardly the first time that Larry had made an obnoxious house call like this. But something about this situation didn't sit right with me. You're under arrest, I said to Larry. He was so used to it by now that he held up his hands automatically, and I clapped the cuffs on him without any fanfare. As I loaded him into the back of the cruiser, I said... I'd like you to come down to the station, John. You're not in any trouble, just want to take a statement, ask you a couple of questions. He sighed, but didn't make a scene. I got the sense that this wasn't his first rodeo with the cops. He approached the passenger door and stopped short when he saw Janine looking out of the window. You running a taxi service here, officer? He said. Get in the back, John, I replied. He's cuffed, he's not going to hurt you. Whedon grumbled something under his breath, then opened the door in the back. He slided in keeping as much distance as possible between himself and Larry, whose head lolled against his drool-stained t-shirt. I climbed into the driver's seat and pulled out of the driveway. Janine looked back at Wheaton, who stared solidly back, his eyes flat and heavy. She leaned in to whisper in my ear. This guy gives me the creeps, she said. I think he's up to something. Yeah, you and me both, I said out of the side of my mouth. Something tells me he's not as innocent as he says. We'll see what they get out of him at the station. What you talking about, ladies? Wheaton asked from the back seat. I was about to make a snarky retort when my cell phone suddenly buzzed. I pulled it out of my pocket and glanced at the caller ID. My heart sank. If the inspector was calling at this hour, something big must have gone down. I answered the call and held the phone up to my ear. What's up, inspector? Sheriff, said the gravelly voice on the line. Static almost drowned him out. The connection was shitty this far out of town. I'm sorry to call you so early. Are you home? On patrol, actually, I replied. Taking a perp down to the station. Did something happen? I was on the trail of... His voice cut out for a second. Brainjacker. It hops bodies, turning its hosts into... Static. I waited for his voice to come back. When it did, his words sent a chill down my spine. Catamount Forest. You need to... What? I need to what? I said. My heart was suddenly pounding. I pressed the phone against my ear, but the inspector's voice had given way to silence. There was a beep, and the call ended. That was the inspector? What did he say? Janine asked. I didn't answer. In the rearview mirror, I could see Wheaton looking sullenly out the window, and Larry mumbling to himself, lost in his drunken fantasy world. Catamount Forest. It hops bodies. Was one of my passengers possessed by a brain jacker the inspector had been hunting? Could this be why Larry had been so belligerent, or why Wheaton kept giving me such uncomfortable vibes? Olivia! Janine called out suddenly. My attention snapped back to the road. A car had come rocketing around the corner, high beams glaring, moving so fast that it chewed up the road in a cloud of pebbles and dirt. The driver must not have been paying attention because the vehicle was halfway in my lane and veered closer. I twisted the wheel and clenched my teeth. We were right on the cliffside, a steep drop into a rocky tree line, and, and there wasn't much room for me to maneuver. I braced myself as the car came barreling towards us. Oh, fuck! We nuttered. Then, collision. The seatbelt dug grooves into my neck as I was whipped back by the force of the impact. Janine's head almost collided with the window as the car spun out. Larry was hollering in the back seat, but my head was spinning, and I couldn't look back to see if he or Whedon had been injured. Everything else was the crunch of metal and the squeal of tires. The second car tried to slam on the brakes and pull away, but our fenders were mashed together, and it spun with us. The lip of the cliff came careening in our direction. I barely had time to reach out and squeeze Janine's hand. Then the wheels slipped over the edge and we were falling. For a second, it felt like gravity had stopped working. We floated there, weightless in our seats. Like one of those carnival rides I hated. 
The one that makes your stomach swoop until you want to vomit. Couldn't see anything through the cracked windshield except a few starry specks in the sky. And then we hit the ground. The other car came loose with an ear-spitting crunch and flipped over us, crashing headlong into a tree. We could barely tell which way was up. My cruiser had hit the dirt tail end first, and its balance was all over kilter. The car swayed and then tipped over backwards. I heard someone scream as the roof struck the ground and the glass on the side windows exploded. Janine, I whispered. The breath had been forced out of me and her name came out in a heavy cough. Janine, are you okay? I'm all right, she said. Her voice was weak and I saw her holding a shaky hand to her head. The world outside the shattered windshield was flipped upside down. Our seat belts had saved our lives. They were the only thing keeping us from falling into the ceiling and bashing our skulls open. I'm fine, thanks for asking, Wheaton said from the back. Can't say the same for Mr. Shitface, though. I twisted in my seat. Larry's unbuckled seatbelt was dangling free, and Larry himself slumped in a heap on the roof, a pool of blood seeping from a wound on his forehead. His breathing was rough, but he was breathing, which I guess was a small miracle. Wheaton was hanging from his seatbelt. Blood pooled in his cheeks and turned them an ugly pink. It looked like the shattered glass had left a nasty cut in his hand. I don't understand, I said. I swear I buckled him in before we left. Guess not, Wheaton grumbled. He reached up and undid his seatbelt, turned his body so that his shoulders struck the ground first. He grimaced and pushed open the dented side door, then crawled outside, leaving a bloody handprint in the dirt. Janine and I did the same. The night air was quiet with barely a whisper of a breeze. Chunks of torn metal were strewn across the forest floor. A few yards away, the second car lay with its engine smashed in. Its frame crumpled around the trunk like it wanted to be part of the tree. I couldn't tell for sure since the vehicle had crushed in on itself like an accordion. I think it might have been a sports car. We need to get Larry out of here, Janine said. I wouldn't normally move someone in his state, but that frame's unstable. It could collapse on him. She and Wheaton pried open the side door and began easing Larry's prone body out into the grass. While they were working, the driver's door on the second car suddenly popped open. A thin man in a navy blue business suit came staggering out. There was a trickle of blood running in a stream from his scalp to the nape of his neck, but otherwise he didn't seem all that hurt. He saw me staring and regained his composure quickly. He strode over to me, his dress shoes crunching loudly in the twigs and little bits of wreckage. Give me your name and license, he demanded. Excuse me, I said. Don't act like you didn't hear me, he replied. Name and license. I don't care if you're a cop. I'm... I'm suing you for destruction of property and grievous bodily harm. Look, buddy, there's a time and a place, I said. We've got an injured person here. I'm not just going to swap insurance info while he's bleeding out. Chill out until we get this whole thing sorted. Chill, he repeated. He stared at me, eyes wide and a bit livid. Do you know who the hell you're talking to right now? I couldn't care less who I'm talking to right now, I said. The man in the suit bristled. Jeremy Belmont, attorney at law, he said. Now give me your name, or I swear to God, I'll... You will what? I shot back. I placed a warning hand on my holster, which made Jeremy clam up immediately. Threaten me all you want, you little shit. I'm still a cop, and I could arrest you in a second. You think I missed that reckless driving of yours up there? If there's anyone to blame for this mess, it's you, so keep running your mouth. I'm sure those threats of yours will sound real nice coming from a jail cell. A vein twitched in Jeremy's temple. He turned away from me, muttering to himself, his hand rummaging in his pocket for his cell phone. I glanced over his shoulder. Through the open driver's door, I saw another person slumped in the passenger seat. A small woman with curly blonde hair. Her head was smashed against the shattered windshield, leaving ragged chunks of her temple exposed. Of course there's no goddamn service out here, Jeremy mumbled. Is she... I said, pointing to the woman in the car. He glanced up at her, then back at his cell phone. She's dead. I already checked. I felt something acidic flare in my chest. What the fuck is wrong with you, man? Look, he said, Laura and I weren't exactly getting along these days, all right? Fighting, 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 all the damn time. She kept threatening me with divorce, saying she'd ruin my career. And when you rammed me with your car, she was yelling at me about how she was going to turn our kids against me or... Something equally insane. I'm not... I'm not gonna shed a tear for that psycho bitch. Blood pulsed in my skull. I was literally seeing red. 
You're a fucking monster. Can't all be heroes, officer, he replied. He glanced over my shoulder, and his brow grew furrowed. I looked behind me. Janine was bandaging Larry's wounds with strips of his shirt, keeping his head elevated against the side of the upside-down cruiser. She moved slowly, delicately, taking care not to worsen any of the bleeding. Wheaton was slumped against a tree, watching the whole scene with those weirdly inscrutable eyes. I'm getting out of here, Jerry said. Do what you have to do. I'm going to call for help. You got no fucking clue where we are, I said. You wander out into those woods, you're going to get hopelessly lost. At least I'll be lost somewhere with cell reception, he retorted. Bye, officer. Then he strode off into the trees, still tapping in frustration at the screen of his smartphone. And I got churned as I watched him go. The guy was despicable. But I didn't like the notion of us splitting up, especially if one of us was possessed by the brain jacker. I looked back at the other three, trying to pick out the telltale signs of a monster. The colored glint in the eye, an unconscious snarl. A flicker as its true form tried to break free. There was nothing. Janine saw me staring and gave me a weary smile. Could you try to call the inspector? She said. You know, with that card of his? You're a genius, I said. I bent over and kissed her, tasting a hint of copper. She'd cut her lip. Then I reached into the pocket for my lighter and the inspector's calling card. I held it at arm's length and flicked the lighter, but it's no use. The device was out of fuel. A single spark flared up and brushed the card, but the scorch mark faded quickly, leaving the surface as blank and reflective as earlier. Is that enough? Janine asked. I don't know. I glanced up towards the cliffside, as if the inspector would poke his head over the lip at any moment. But the night stayed quiet. Just birdsong and the creak of branches in the wind. I had a feeling he wasn't coming. You people are nuts, Wheaton said. Starting to think that lawyer guy had the right idea. That guy was a piece of shit, I replied. He's so used to getting his way that he thinks he's going to wander right into a clearing with perfect cell reception. Probably with a stocked fridge and a swimming pool while he's at it. I wouldn't count on him to get us out of this mess. I mean, yeah, fuck him, Wheaton agreed. He's going to end up going in circles or die of starvation or whatever. But I know these woods. I grew up in them. I just have to follow the cliffside and I'll get back to town eventually. Then I can send someone back to pick you guys up. I still wasn't the biggest fan of the Scooby-Doo split them up mentality, but I wasn't sure that we had much choice. I reached into my front seat to my cruiser and tried sending a message on the comm radio. <sighs> Dead as a doornail. I had no phone service, no radio, and worst of all, no inspector. Whedon's little trek may have been our only option. Okay, fine, I said. Be careful out there. I looked down at Larry, who was stirring feebly against the cruiser. How long does that guy have left? He's stable for now, Janine said. But we should get him to the hospital as soon as possible. Larry let out a cough then, his eyes opening dimly. One shaky hand lifted up and pointed an accusing finger at Wheaton. The other man stared back at him, waiting. Larry opened his mouth and burbled out a bit of blood. Your coffee tastes like shit, he mumbled. Like little human shit. A smirk played on Wheaton's face. Fuck you too, Hogan, he said. Then he turned and plunged headlong into the trees, his short frame slipping into the darkness. For a while, Larry drifted in and out of consciousness, mumbling to himself. Janine sat by his side and continued to apply pressure to his head wound. When the first layer of bandages got too soaked, she ripped free another strand of t-shirt and doubled over the bloody area. I couldn't bring myself to sit, so I paced, back and forth, back and forth, my shoes crunching on little bits of debris from the wreck. Whedon had been gone for almost ten minutes. I mean, I knew it would take him a while to get back to town, but still, I was getting antsy. You're gonna dig a hole in the dirt with all that pacing, Janine said. Come sit down for a bit. She patted the ground next to her. But Whedon, I started, worrying about him won't help anyone, she said. There's nothing we can do except wait, so we might as well wait together. I begrudgingly took a seat. Janine tucked her arm around mine and we nestled in together, listening to the distant calls of birdsong. There was a sliver of moon up above, but the sky was clear, sprinkled with stars. 
whole scene was actually kind of peaceful. That is, if you ignored the two smashed cars and the dead woman in the passenger seat, and the passed out drunk with the bleeding head wound. Larry stirred, drifting back to the waking world. He opened his bleary eyes and flashed us a wide grin. You two are real cute, he slurred. John had a girl as cute as you, you know, except she didn't stick around long. <laughs> he hiccuped. I wonder why. I shared a glance with Janine. You knew John pretty well, huh? I asked. Oh, yeah, he said. I couldn't tell if he was still drunk or just woozy from his injury. I'd go visit a lot. We'd play card and poker and shit. Guys lousy at cards, though. Can't tell a king from a big stinking deuce. He giggled. You make a decent cup of coffee, neither. You said Wheaton owed you money, I cut in. Is that true? Larry's stupid grin turned to a grimace. Some bitch never paid up after the last game. Fucking sore loser. A blotch of red on his makeshift bandages grew a little thicker. I had to get what was mine, you know, it's only right. Easy, Janine said in a soft voice. Larry had tried to wriggle out of his reclined position, so she eased him back down. He mumbled a bit and rested his head against the cruiser. His eyes fluttered closed, and his breathing grew slow, steady. He was back in dreamland. Then a scream of pain cut through the night. I shot to my feet, hands snapping automatically to my holster. A cloud of dark birds burst from the treetops about half a mile away. I watched them flap away as the scream faded. The quiet of the night sweeping back in over the forest. What was that? Janine whispered. The scream hadn't woken Jerry. His head still lolled against the car, but my wife's eyes were wide and nervous. It might be Wheaton, I said. Janine, if he's hurt... I have to go help him. He's our only shot at getting out of here. The fear disappeared from her eyes and she nodded. Go, she said. Make sure he's okay. I'll keep Larry safe. I leaned down to kiss her one more time. Taste of copper still light on her lips. Then I turned and charged into the darkness of the trees. I kept my gun whipped out in front of me just in case. The woods were dark and I could only see a few trees ahead. And even those were just the faintest of outlines. I tried to picture those birds bursting from the forest to make a beeline towards the source of the disturbance. For a few minutes, I was afraid that I'd lost the trail entirely, that I'd gotten turned around somewhere along the way. Then my shoes trod on something squishy, and I heard a sickening snap. I backpedaled and squinted in the shadows on the ground. I hadn't stepped on a twig. The snap had been the bones breaking in a human hand. I followed the figure's arm up to the neck, and then its head had a deep red color that I couldn't quite make out in the dark. I fumbled for my phone and activated the flashlight. When my eyes adjusted to the brightness, I saw that Jeremy Belmont was lying face down in the dirt, the back of his skull dented and bloody. I didn't have to check his pulse to know that our asshole lawyer friend was dead. Something had struck him in the head. And hard. And maybe I should say someone because this was the middle of the woods, far away from any rock slide. There was no way a wound that deep could have been an accident. I got on my knees and I began sweeping the ground for the murder weapon. When I looked up, Wheaton was standing above the body. Jesus, I breathed. I clambered to my feet and pointed my gun at him. Wheaton saw the barrel aim straight at his chest and stiffened. He raised his hands slowly, one of them bloody. But then again, it had been bloody before. Did you do this? I hissed. Hell no! He said, I was over by the cliff when I heard a scream. Thought it might have been one of you guys, so I came looking. He let out a shaky breath. I, di I didn't do it, officer, I swear. I scrutinized him. His eyes were wide and a little bloodshot, but I didn't see a glimpse of any colors that shouldn't be there. If there was something squatting in his brain, it was buried deep. Or maybe it had already left. Maybe to use Wheaton's body to murder Jeremy, then left to occupy some other poor sucker's skull. And at this hour, there was only a few poor suckers out here for it to choose from. I holstered my gun and I grabbed Wheaton by the arm. We're going back to the crash site, I said. This changes things. I'm not letting you out of my sight until we get back to town. When Wheaton's face soured, I added, You stick with me or I'll shoot you. I'm not kidding around. Why are we going back there? He muttered. They'll just waste more time. Because I'm not ditching my wife in the woods without at least explaining why, I said. Now shut up, get moving. 
we left Jeremy's body and trudged back towards the scene of the crash. Keeping the looming edge of the cliff as our landmark, neither of us spoke along the way. I didn't trust Wheaton, and I was pretty damn sure that he didn't trust me either. Our footsteps made loud crunches in the blanket of leaves and twigs. I kept twisting my head to peer into the darkness, but there was nothing around us except... Except... Nothing. Somehow that was even worse. The crash site came back into view. I saw Janine, still crouched by Larry's side, her hand touching the skin on his neck. She looked up and saw us approaching. Something like fear came into her eyes. She stood up, leaving Larry to slump against the side of the car. I'm sorry, she said, approaching us. I tried. I did the best I could, but... What happened? I asked. I reached out and grabbed her hand. It was trembling. She swallowed. Larry's dead. Felt like I'd ingested a bucket of ice. My veins had gone cold. I looked past her and I saw Larry propped up in that awkward seating position. No life in his eyes, just a dull hollowness, but he looked more like a sleepwalker than a corpse. If Janine hadn't told me otherwise, I might have thought that he was just in a drunken stupor. He was doing fine at first, but then he started complaining about pain in his feet. Real sharp, like walking on hot coals. I tried to find him water in case he was getting dehydrated or something, but then he started flailing. I had to hold him down before he could hurt himself, and I, I let go when he stopped struggling. I thought he'd just tired himself out. But when I felt his pulse, he was gone. There was something wrong with her voice. A kind of detached hollowness that I wasn't used to hearing. Her eyes, too, glimmered with something more than moonlight. I thought of the inspector's call. It hops bodies. I withdrew my hand slowly from hers. She looked at me, confused for a second. Then I pulled my gun out of its holster. Olivia? She said quietly. Get the hell out of my wife, I growled. Janine backed up. I'd never seen a look of such fear on her face before, but I wasn't sure if it was her fear or the creatures inside her. I couldn't bring myself to point the gun directly at her, but I stood there, clenching it in my hand, my finger twitching above the trigger. She raised her hands in a gesture of shaky surrender. What's going on, Olivia? The inspector warned me about this, I said. He told me there was a brain jacker hopping in people's bodies, taking over their minds. I don't know who had it first, but it's been picking us off one by one. First the lawyer's wife, then Jeremy, then Larry. My hand tightened on the pistol. Where does it stop, huh? Does it end when everyone's dead in the dirt? Honey, it's not me, she said. I promise, maybe the inspector's right. Maybe there is something out there, but it's not me. Just put the gun away, please. I can't know that, I said. I felt a tear trickle down the corner of my eye. I lifted the gun then, flicking back the safety and squinting through the damp eyes of my wife. Janine's face had gone utterly white. Birds chirped in the night. Cars roared down a distant road. But everything else was silent. Like the world was waiting for that one single gunshot to ring out. Oh, stop it already, a voice said from behind me. It's not her. I jumped and nearly dropped the pistol. When I turned, I saw Wheaton standing by the wreckage of the Belmont's car. I almost forgotten about him. His eyes were unreadable as ever, but in his hand, he clutched his own battered Glock. There was a light click as he thumbed back the safety. You? I said. You're the brain jacker? You're off your fucking nut, officer. You know that? He replied. Ain't no such thing as a brain jacker. You and those other cops are out there running around like headless chickens chasing monsters that don't exist. If you're not doing your job, it just means someone else got to do it for you. What are you talking about? Larry over there is a cheater and a miserable drunk, Wheaton said. You know, he goes home and hits his wife. Never got a call from her, I bet. Too afraid of what he'd do when he gets back from the slammer. His lips drew back in a sneer. Guys like him don't deserve to live. So I've been slipping him rat poison in his coffee. Real old stuff from back when they made it with thallium and shit. Bastard's hair has been falling out for weeks. Never caught on. I stared at him. The gun felt cold in my hand and I wondered what he would do if I moved a muscle. I was a fast shot, but Wheaton already had me in his sights. I didn't think I could beat his trigger finger. Best thing to do was to keep him talking. And Belmont? I asked, keeping my voice steady. You killed him too? Like you said, guy was a piece of shit, Wheaton snorted. You heard how he talked about his wife. Plus, the way he got in your face? 
Got my blood boiling. So sick of fancy college boys thinking their money and sports cards give them the right to stomp all over folks like us. I did us all a favor by offering the guy. World's better off without him. I pick my next words very carefully. I know you think you're doing the right thing here. Those guys were pretty awful, I'll give you that. We've got laws for a reason. There's a process for stuff like this. Without it, you get... Vigilante justice. You get... Well, you get an angry mob. You get anarchy. I took a deep breath. If you just come down to the station, maybe we could... Nah, he interrupted. No offense, officer. I don't trust you cops. Never known one who wasn't some kind of backstabber. Only reason I'm bothering to tell you all this because you ain't going to survive the night. I flinched. My arm swinging up, but Wheaton moved faster. He planted his feet and fired two shots. The first one sank into the skin of my forearm, sending a roar of agony down my fingers. I lost track of the second one. My nerves were screaming, but I gritted my teeth and blinked the hot tears of pain from my eyes. I fired three shots of my own. Unlike Wheaton, I had practiced with this sort of thing, and all three bullets hit their target. The scumbag was knocked off his feet. He struck the side of Jeremy's sports car and slid to the ground. Eyes vacant. Three puckered holes in his forehead. I gasped and swayed on my feet. The waves of pain were sweeping me over now, threatening to pull me under. I fought them with gritted teeth. The echoes of gunshots had muted the sounds of the night. I could hear the engine of an approaching car, still distant but getting closer. Help, my brain whispered. Help was almost here. Janine! I said shakily. Janine, we have to! But I stopped. Janine was no longer standing where I had left her. She was lying on the dirt. Her breathing unsteady, her eyes staring up at the little sliver of the moon. Her slowly growing puddle of red seeping across the chest of her nursing uniform. No. I breathed. No, no, fuck no! Janine! I staggered over to her side. Wheaton's bullet had pierced her right in the abdomen. Her blood was gushing freely from the point of entry. I was at no state to administer proper first aid, but I I tried, damn it. I applied the necessary pressure, and I kept her elevated and clotted the wound with the wads of ripped fabric, and at some point I found myself administering CPR. Except it wasn't CPR. I was just kissing her, and I was crying and praying that she would kiss me back. Olivia? She said once. Her voice was weak, like someone calling from another room. Olivia, I... I... Don't say anything, I said. Just keep breathing and stay awake. Help will be here soon. And it was. The engine of the approaching car was right on top of us. And then its headlights were seeping across the forest. Its tires perched on the very edge of the cliff. There was a slam as somebody opened the driver's door. The dark shape came hurtling through the night, and the inspector landed like a mountain lion in front of us, his trench coat whipping behind him like a pair of enormous gray wings. His cigar smoke was a muted shade of yellow. I'm sorry I took so long, he said in that gravelly voice of his, and I felt a wave of comfort wash through the pain. It took more time than I expected to deal with the brain jacker. I could tell that you'd tried to ignite the card, but the signal was weak. I didn't know where to find you until I heard the gunshots. It's okay, I whispered. My energy was leaving me. I could barely keep myself standing. I ended up leaning against the inspector's chest and clutching at the sleeves of his coat. It's okay, you're here. Flashes of red and blue joined the glare of the headlights. I closed my eyes for a moment, and when I opened them again, I was rumbling down the road in the back of an ambulance. I twisted my head in the gurney and saw a massive bandage wrapped around the bullet hole in my arm. The inspector was sitting by my side, his fedora in his lap. I'd never seen the top of his head before. His hair was thick, but the same grayish shade as the rest of his skin. So it was hard to tell where his scalp ended and the hair began. Inspector, I said in a raspy voice. He said nothing. I looked past him at the other gurney, where two EMTs were fussing over the other patient. I couldn't see much of Janine. Through the gaps in the crowd, all I could make out was her outstretched torso and a single pale hand dangling over the side of the gurney. Will she be okay? The inspector couldn't tell the future any more than I could. But somehow I knew he'd have the answer. He always did. I stared up at him, and he stared down at me, and then... Then he turned his eyes to the rumbling floor of the ambulance. There was nothing he needed to say. Because deep down, 
I knew the answer too. Olivia Marconi. Good evening once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I want to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Or for listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. That's available on Spotify. Or on Apple Music. Or on uh, any, any other places that you can get podcasts. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure where people listen to podcasts. Uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, though, I would really appreciate if you click the subscribe button. Click that thumbs up button and hit the bell for me. Because that's what we're supposed to say now. We're required by YouTube law. As always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, and you allow us to get a whole bunch of custom stories that are only heard here on this channel, on this podcast. So, a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Payne Gravy, Inactive Hermit, Austin Johnson, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Maria Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Suzaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Miss Xander, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. And of course, everybody who's down there in the description as well, and everybody who can support on Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta for even $1, I appreciate it greatly, and I'm sure that all the authors that we were able to work with appreciate it too. So, thank you guys so much, thank you for listening, and sweet dreams.